Hello, I'm Guy Shavit, the Product Manager at Signamax for Network Solutions. And today, we're going to go over the options to provide PoE over extended distances. Uh, first, a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, if you're interested in a Dixie uh, continuing education credit for this course, uh, then you have to do it live on the webinar. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can either look at our events page for when we have one scheduled or send an email uh, to uh, our technical supporter, a marketing, and uh, we'll let you know when our next scheduled uh, webinar is. Okay. I'm going to start. Okay, what are we going to go over? Uh, first, we'll talk a little bit about POE, what it is, why it exists. Uh, we'll go over the standards, uh, the differences between them and their uh, specifics uh, uh, that are related at least to uh, the uh, distance calculations. Uh, then we'll discuss three options uh, for providing PoE over distances beyond the, the standard 100 meters. Uh, the first one are uh, PoE repeaters. Uh, the second one is going to be VDSL extenders. Uh, and the third is going to be uh, composite fiber. Uh, we'll then do a little uh, comparison between the di three different options and discuss the use cases and, and ideal situations for each one. Okay, so what is PoE and uh, where does it come from? Uh, I will mention here that we also have a introduction to PoE uh, uh, webinar and, and video uh, that goes into a lot more detail, uh, not only about the history, uh, but also about uh, the, the standards, uh, the protocol, the handshake, how it works, and so on. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can, you can go watch that video. So uh, POE was invented uh, in the mid-90s uh, as a solution, really, to uh, power voice over IP handsets uh, in a, a way that is similar to how traditional POP phones are, are powered over uh, the communication line. Uh, this was necessary uh, for uh, mass adaptation of voice over IP in enterprises. Uh, otherwise, uh, we, we would need a, a power outlet for every uh, phone and, and in a lot of locations, I uh, think, uh, you know, big call centers and so on that had hundreds or thousands of, of uh, people on phones in a, you know, in a single location just were not set up and didn't have that infrastructure. Uh, the devices that are powered, uh, this is the, the phones, the cameras, uh, the access points and so on are called uh, power devices, PDs. Uh, in the presentation later, I'm, I'm going to use that shorthand quite a lot. The devices that are providing the power are called uh, PSCs or power sourcing equipment. Uh, and there are two types of PSCs. This isn't relevant for our uh, presentation here, but uh, just for the, the terminology, endpoints are PSCs. Uh, where the PoE functionality is put into the communication device, uh, usually a, a Ethernet switch. Midspans are uh, PSCs that are put between the communication device and the PD, and all they do is inject power. So these are also called sometimes PoE injectors. Okay, why PoE? Uh, I mean, the, I mentioned the, the the main reason for the development of PoE and the main use case and, and reason is just to be able to use a single uh, cable to power and provide the communication uh, to the equipment. Uh, additional advantages uh, are you know, just the flexibility of being able to, to place where you can place the, the, the PD and, and move the PD easily without having to have an electrician come and, and move an AC uh, line. Uh, but there are also uh, certain uh, functionality advantages. Uh, for example, uh, if you want the need to provide backup power, uh, like a UPS, uh, to all the devices, it is much easier uh, to do that at the IDF to the switch than it is than it would be uh, to do it for 20, you know, 30, 40 say, individual devices uh, if they were you know, powered locally. Uh, and another uh, advantage that is uh, specifically relevant or important when it comes to IP cameras 
Uh, it's just that you can uh, remotely reset the device. Uh, you know, the camera uh, gets uh, stuck, freezes. Uh, if it was locally powered, uh, someone would have to physically go out there and pull the plug on it. Uh, if it's powered by PoE and it's a managed uh, PSC, you can log in and reset the device remotely. Okay, let's get to the standards. Uh, the initial PoE standard uh, was 8023AF, was approved uh, by IEEE in 2003. Uh, it defined that the PSC needs to be able to uh, provide up to 15.4 watts, uh, and the PD can expect to receive up to 12.95. Why is there a difference between them? Uh, we'll see this later in the whole calculations, but the, the system needs to uh, provide uh, the, the or, or take into consideration the, the loss on the line. Uh, this is worst case scenario, meaning lowest gouge uh, cable, maximum distance, uh, which in the case of uh, the standard uh, in 8023AF is 100 meters, 328 feet. 2009, uh, a second standard, which is 802.3AT, was uh, approved. Uh, at this point, uh, we're moving beyond just voice over IP handsets, which don't require a whole lot of power. Uh, we're talking IP cameras. We're talking maybe video conferencing equipment and so on. So the main reason for the new standard is increasing uh, the the power capabilities. Uh, again, this is 30 watts at the PSC, 25.5 watts at the PD. Uh, 8023AT also introduces the concept of types. Uh, type 1 are the legacy 8023AF devices. Type 2 are the newer 8023AT devices. Uh, and very importantly, it specifies full backward compatibility. Uh, either the you know, type 1 PSC uh, will work with a type 2 PD, vice versa. Obviously, uh, if the PSC, though, is type 1, the maximum power you're going to get is, is, a, is that 15.4 watts, uh, but the handshake, uh, it, it has in it uh, full compatibility, so uh, either a PD or a PSC can support uh, uh, either standard and fully operate it. 2018, we got a uh, newer and latest standard, which is 8023BT. Uh, this is known in the market as either PoE++ or uh, sometimes you'll see people use high PoE. It is not UPoE, which was a proprietary uh, Cisco-developed protocol that is uh, the predecessor, if you will, for 8023BT, but they are not uh, compatible and and, you know, if you do see devices that are UPoE, they will not necessarily work with standard 8023B key devices. Uh, 8023B key introduces two new types, type 3 and type 4. Type 3 is kind of like the uh, continuation uh, of the previous uh, standards and has the full backwards compatibility. Uh, it is up to 60 watts at the PSC, 51 watts at the PD. Uh, type 4 uh, is the higher power, what you see, uh, 90 watts at the PSC, uh, even though that translates to only 71.3 watts at the PD uh, and, and has special and very specific uh, additional rules uh, related to it, uh, which makes it not backward compatible in that same sense. Uh, the additional, uh, additional big change that was made in this standard uh, has to do with uh, uh, power and standby mode. Uh, PoE initially, uh, since it was used to power voice over IP, handsets, and access points, cameras, uh, standby, the, the amount of power consumed in a situation where the device is not actually use, doing anything uh, was not critically important. Uh, 8023BT uh, has its eye on Internet of Things, uh, lighting, uh, and so forth, uh, where that becomes a lot more critical. Uh, so uh, changes were made so that the standby power actually gets reduced tenfold. Uh, uh, 
Let me go through this. There we go. The special regulations that have to do with type four to have to do with heat. Uh, let me jump through this. Again, if you want more details about the standards uh, specifically, uh, you could look at the POE introduction webinar. Okay, let's summarize this. We've got four types uh, of devices. Uh, we've got the how much you know power the PSC needs to be able to provide according to the spec. How much power the PD can expect to receive. Uh, we'll also see that there is a voltage range. Right in the original standard, the PSC could provide power anywhere between 44 to 57 volts, uh, and due to voltage drop on the line, the PD had to be able to function with anywhere between 37 and 57 volts. Okay. We see that in uh, type two, uh, that voltage range is, uh, is shrunk and uh, the, lower, uh, the lower end is brought up, so now uh, it needs to provide 50 to 57 volts. Uh, why is that? Uh, the higher the power that you're transmitting, the more loss you're going to get. Uh, in order to counter that, uh, they're attempting to increase the, the voltage because you'll, you'll have less loss at a higher voltage. Uh, this is the reason why, you know, inner city lines are high voltage, right? You'll, you'll have less loss the higher the voltage you use. We cannot go above that 57 volts uh, due to regulation, right? Under 57 is considered a low voltage. Anything above that, the rules are totally different. You need an electrician. You need, you know, it's totally different standards. Uh, so PoE is always going to be limited with that 57 volt at the high end, but we can try to move up, or the, the standards boards is moving up the lower end in order to, to limit the loss. Uh, by increasing uh, that lower end to 50 volts, the, the PD is also uh, – not required or does not need to to support anything below 42.5 volts at this point. Uh, type three we see is the same. Type four there is an increase, uh, a slight increase in the lower end up to 52 volt again due to the, the higher power. Uh, we also see that the original standard uh, worked or supported category three or better. Remember this was a standard that was created uh, to uh, support voice over IP handsets as replacements for, um, you know, phone lines that, that had existing cabling that was uh, going to be very often Category 3. Uh, 802.3AT and, and, the, and the newer standards, the POE Plus, POE Plus Plus, uh, are already Category 5 or better. Uh, there's no longer support for Category 3. Also to note is that the original POE standard as well as 802.3AT uh, used two pairs uh, in of the of the cable to provide power. Uh, there was a mode A and a mode B. It's not relevant here. Again, go to the POE introduction uh, webinar to learn about that. Uh, 8023BT uh, introduces four pair mode. This is one of the ways uh, that they were able to increase uh, the the power is by using all four pairs, and we're going to see later when we do the calculations how uh, important that is. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the power calculation. Uh, there is uh, no need uh, when you are using standard PoE over standard distances, meaning up to 100 meters, uh, to ever do these calculations because the spec defines it so that any device that uh, – adheres to the spec uh, would be fully compatible within these distances, you, assuming you're within a distance and within the, uh, the, the minimum uh, cabling requirements. Uh, we're going to do this calculation because when we start talking about our longer distance options, uh, then you, you do need to calculate to make sure that uh, you have as much power as you need or, or, or what type of cabling you need to use and so on. Now, this whole calculation here, this is basic Ohm's law. Uh, this is just DC power. Uh, uh, there's nothing special here in relations to PoE, but uh, this is, uh, you know, that, that, that's, that's how it works. Okay, so first of all, we can calculate what the current is on the circuit, and the calculation there is going to be uh, the power out at the PSC divided by the voltage. 
uh, then we can calculate what the voltage drop is across the cable. Uh, there's going to be a voltage drop because the cable has some level of resistance, right? And the way the voltage drop calculation is, it's going to be the current on the circuit multiplied by the resistance of the cable. Uh, and then that way we find out, okay, now what the voltage actually is at the PD. It's going to be the voltage of the PSC minus the drop. Uh, and then we can calculate the actual power, the actual wattage available for the PD. It's going to be that voltage that is at the PD multiplied by the current, and that's going to be, uh, you know, how much power is available for PD. So let's do an example here. We're going to use an 8023AF, that means just, you know, the first generation PoE. Uh, class 3 uh, just means that it's a, up to a 15.4 watt uh, device, okay? Uh, so first of all, step one, calculate the current. Uh, the output is 15.4 watts. Uh, now I'm dividing here by a voltage of 48. If you remember in the standard, uh, there's a range between 44 and 57. I just picked, let's say, a device that, that is using 48 uh, volts for the, the purpose of the example, but this is going to be device dependent. Uh, that comes out to 0 0.32 amps. Now, in this example, I'm using a Category 5E cable going 100 meters. Uh, so the voltage drop is going to be that current that we calculate in step one multiplied by the cable resistance. What's the cable resistance? Well, Category 5E has a resistance of 0 0.0842 per meter, and I'm multiplying it by 200 because you have to remember this is round trip, right? If, I, if my distance is 100 meters, the circuit is going from the PSC to the PD back to the PSC. That's the length of the circuit, so I'm always going to be going, multiplying it by double the distance. And then I'm dividing it by two. Why am I dividing it by two? Because we're using two pairs. So we actually have two circuits going. The resistance is, is uh, uh, or the, the current on each one is half, so the drop will be half. Do the calculation. You see a voltage drop of 2.7 uh, volts. That means that the voltage that I'm going to get at the PD is 45.3. And that means that the power available to the PD, and then multiply that voltage by the current, is 14.54. Now, why am I not getting 12.95, as I you know, showed you in the standard? Well, one, we're using a Category 5E cable here, so that's not the worst case, uh, the worst or lowest quality supported cable in 8023F. That would be a, a Category 3, so the resistance uh, is lower, so we have less loss. And two, uh, we used in this example 48 volts, uh, which is not the worst case scenario in the, in the standard. So if we did the calculation with 44 volts and we used the resistance of a CAT3 cable, then you would get to 12.95. This is just to show you uh, that in reality, in most cases, due to using higher quality cable, due to the fact that most runs are less than 100 meters and so on, you actually have more power available than specified in the spec, right? The spec is worst case scenario, uh, but anyone making a PD2 spec uh, will, can't assume that. They always have to assume worst case scenario, hence that's 12.95. Let's do one more example calculation here. This time we got an 8023BT uh, device, it's type three, class six is in type three, meaning 60 watts at the PSC. Uh, so I got the power out is 60. This time I'm dividing by uh, uh, 53 uh, volts. I'm sorry, I just saw that the screen wasn't updated yet, but you should see it now. Uh, I'm dividing by 53 volts. Uh, why 53 volts? Uh, if we go back to our cable here, uh, you remember that type three uh, I'm waiting for it to, to update for you, uh, but the voltage range at the PSC was between uh, 50 and 57, right? So we can't use that 48 like we used in the previous uh, uh, example. Uh, but, uh, you know, I just picked 53. That's a common 
uh, voltage out in the NATO 238T uh, devices. But again, depending on the device, it might be anywhere between 50 and 57. So that gives us a current of 1.132. Uh, step two, we're going to calculate uh, the voltage drop uh, across the cable. Uh, now, in this example, I was using uh, a Category 6 cable, again, going 100 meters. Uh, we'll see in this calculation here, the resistance per meter of the CAT6 is a little bit lower than it was in the previous example of CAT5E, uh, so uh, it's, it, it will have less of a voltage drop. Uh, we're still multiplying it by 200 uh, because, again, 100 meters round trip, but this time we're dividing by four, not by two, because 8023BT uses all four pairs, right? So that, that's why I said this is a, a, a big uh, way that we were able to increase the power. Uh, not only, uh, you know, you have more media transit, if you will, but you also have less, uh, less of a drop. The, the voltage at the PD ends up being 49.22, and if we multiply that by the, the current, we see 55.72. Again, why did my calculation not come out, uh, you know, 51 as the spec says? Uh, one, I was not using worst cable, right? I was using a category six here, not a category five E. Uh, two, I wasn't using worst case scenario in the voltage. Uh, if we were using 50 volts for the voltage in a category 5E, then we would come out to, to 51 volts. So this shows you uh, that the, the, the medium uh, matters. Okay, let's talk about the different methods that we have to extend distance. Uh, and the first one we're going to talk about is uh, PoE repeaters. Uh, these are commonly in the market called PoE extenders. I'm, I'm using the term repeater here uh, because uh, both this and the VDSL extenders we talk about later are referred to as PoE extenders in the market, and I, and I just want to make separate them because of the way they function is totally different. Uh, the PoE repeaters, uh, again, very commonly called PoE extenders. Uh, these are PoE in, PoE out device, no AC power, uh, very simple. Uh, you plug them in midline after up to 100 meters, you get another 100 meters. They regenerate the signal and the PoE. Uh, they get powered in line from, uh, from the PSC. Now, there are two types historically of these. Uh, one that had one side functioning as a PD, did the whole handshake and so on with the, the PSC, gets powered and so on, and its other side uh, functions as a PSC, or the, the PD gets, the gets connected. The second type uh, was uh, like a pass-through, right? It itself did not initiate the handshake. It didn't have that functionality. Uh, and only when the PD was connected at the end uh, would that initiate uh, the, you know, the, 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 the handshake and, and talk directly with the, the PSC. Nowadays in the market, I think all or almost all of uh, the PoE repeaters you're going to find are the first type. Uh, they, they've got the chip that functions the PD. It's got the, uh, you know, the 25K ohm resistance and the capacitance and so on between the pairs. Uh, and so if you plug them into a PSC, they themselves will get powered. You'll see a link uh, on, the, on your switch and so forth. Uh, I, I'm not a familiar. There might still be some legacy products on the market, but I'm not familiar with them. You also see that uh, repeaters can be daisy chains to go beyond the 200 meters. Uh, I do not recommend that for two reasons. One, we're going to see later in the calculations that you start, the power that is available to you at further distances uh, it drops very quickly, very far. Uh, two, it just becomes uh, multiple points of failure, if you will. That's a little bit more risky. And three, since these need to be put midline uh, from a maintenance standpoint, I mean, you, you need to have a, a place that you can place some uh, some kind of enclosure, maybe something if it's outdoors or, or something, and, and, you know, you need to know where they are for maintenance purposes since they themselves uh, do not have, you know, they don't connect AC power and so on. They, they're somewhere in the ceiling. It just becomes uh, – you got multiple of these, it's, it's harder to maintain than one of the other solutions that we have. 
But in theory, it's possible to daisy chain them. There are also uh, multi-port repeaters. Uh, so these, this would be a device uh, that you know, has a uh, PD uh, connect to uh, a, a, a PSE uh, and then has multiple downlink ports that you can connect PDs to. Uh, the main functionality of these is not to extend, right? They're usually, it's just to, to provide multiple PDs over a single line. So very typically you'll have, you know, switch, have a line run, let's say to some, you know, pull or some, you know, some, some, a gate or something like that, where you might have two cameras or camera and access points and so on, but you just be able to use a single line and provide power and, and ethernet to, to multiple devices uh, without any power requirements at this location. Uh, so this is the, the solution. So typically the PDs are not that far from this, uh, you know, repeater, but uh, technically each one of these is a, you know, a ethernet up to a hundred meter uh, link. So uh, we're gonna do some calculations with these as well. Okay, let's start with a power calculation for uh, 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 PoE repeaters. Uh, the first step is gonna be the same as we did before. Uh, we're gonna calculate the current uh, on the circuit. It's gonna be the, the power out of the PSC divided by the voltage. Then we add a new step. Step 1.5 uh, is uh, to calculate the resistance uh, you know, in the previous time version, we, we, we calculated the, the, the resistance of the, well, we had the resistance of the cable. Here we have to calculate the resistance of the cable plus the repeaters, right? And the way you calculate the resistance of the repeaters is you look up and inspect what the maximum consumption of the repeater is, uh, and you divide that by the, the maximum current, uh, you know, per the, the, the standard. Uh, and then that will give you the repeater uh, uh, resistance. No one, uh, no one states on the spec sheet the resistance of the, the repeater, so we're going to have to calculate it. Uh, we then calculate the voltage drop, same as we did previously. That gives us the actual voltage at the PD, and then we can calculate the power available for the PD. Okay, so let's do an example. Uh, this example is going to have two repeaters. That means we're going 300 meters. Uh, and they're going to be 802.3AT uh, devices, PDs, okay? So first, we're calculating uh, the output, uh, the, the current on the circuit. Uh, so the power out is 30 uh, watts, since this is 802.3AT. Uh, and I've this, uh, you know, divided here by 56 volts, again, per the standard. Uh, it could be anywhere between 50 and 57. This is just an example, so you, you have to find that out for the device. Uh, so I use 56 here. Uh, that gives me the current. Now I'm going to calculate the resistance across the entire cable. So first, uh, we do the, the cable resistance, which was similar to what we did before. This is, looks like I used the CAT6 in this case, because that's the resistance per meter for CAT6. Multiplying it by 600, again, we're... For the example, this is a 300 meters of cable, so round trip, 600, divided by two because we're using two pair. And then this is where we're calculating the resistance of the repeaters themselves. Uh, in this example, the, the repeater spec sheet says it consumes up to two watts, so that's that two here. Dividing by 0 0.6 because that is the maximum current per 802.3AT spec, uh, our circuit here is going to be running 0 0.536, but that's because we have 56 volts, right? If we had 50 volts, uh, then it would come out to 0 0.6. Hence, that's the worst case in standard. Uh, when the vendor or manufacturer of the repeater writes 2 watts on their spec sheet, uh, that's assuming a worst case scenario, you know, 0 0.6 uh, uh, current. So, uh, that's what we're using in the calculation. And then we're multiplying this by two because we've got two repeaters in this example, right? That gives us a total resistance of 31.15 ohms. 
Uh, we plug that in to calculate the voltage drop, which is 16.7 volts. That gives us a voltage at the PD of 39.3. And that gives us, when we multiply the current, a power available for the PD of 21 watts. Now, that's not so bad, right? We, uh, you know, they, they expect, they, they, the most that can be expected by uh, a PD that's 802.3AT is 45.5. So uh, if this is a PD, we'd have to look at its spec sheet uh, that needs above 21 watts, then, then we, the solution will not work. But if it's something that needs less than 21 watts, it looks like we're good and we could use it. But if you remember, and if I go back uh, to this, uh, the table we were looking at earlier, uh, we will see, and I know we're waiting for the screen to refresh here. Uh, we'll see, though, that an 8023AT uh, type 2 device, per the spec, the voltage range at the PD is supposed to be between 42.5 and 57, right? Uh, in our calculation here, we come out with a voltage for the PD of 39.3. That is below the range of the spec. What does that mean? That means device might work, device might not, not work, but no, there's no guarantee, right? There's a good chance uh, that the manufacturer of the, that's if a camera or an access point, uh, has components in there that work slightly more extended range than what the, the spec uh, states, but it's not a guarantee. So I can't, unless I, you know, test that and know the device and know that it works or like that, I can't assume that it does. So how do I calculate what the real maximum power that is available to me, uh, guaranteed, if you will. So the way we got to do this is we start now by uh, we're using the same, you know, the same formula as in Ohm's law. We're just we're just doing it uh, in reverse, if you will. We're going to start with calculating what is the allowed voltage drop, right? And uh, in, it, again, in our example here, the PSC is outputting 56 volts. The standard says at 42.5 volts at the PD, I'm assured that the PD is going to work. So that tells me that I have uh, a voltage budget, if you will, of 13.5 volts. I can lose 13.5 volts on the line and still be, you know, within the spec for the PD. Now I use the same formula we used before, uh, but instead of, you know, plugging in the current and the resistance and calculating the voltage drop, I'm going to plug in the voltage drop that I know, plug in the resistance that is the same calculation we did, uh, you know, previously, and use that to calculate what my maximum current is, which is 0 0.433. Using that, multiplying by the voltage, gives me a maximum power of 18.38. So now, if my PD says that it needs 18.38 watts or less, I know that I can place it over a category six, 300 meters using these two repeaters, uh, and it, and it will, and it, it will work. If it needs more than that, I don't know that. It's not guaranteed, right? It might work if it works, if it's okay at a lower voltage, it might not work. Again, up to that 21, uh, watts where if it needs more than that, then it definitely won't work, right? So this is, this is how we calculate to see, uh, if, if we can use this solution for that PD or if we need to find either a different PD or a different uh, solution. Okay, now let's do a calculation uh, that is a, for a multiport repeater. Uh, in this example, uh, I'm using 8023BT uh, at the PSC uh, and 8023AT PDs. Uh, so first, again, all the calculations now we're going to do like we did this last one. We're going to start with the allowed voltage drop. Assuming here that I got 56 volts coming out of uh, the PSC, uh, the allowed voltage at the PD is 42.5. So, so the, the voltage drop, allowed voltage drop is 13.5 volts, same as the previous example. Uh, I'm plugging in here for the resistance. This is a Category 6 resistance. Uh, I'm multiplying by 400 because in this case, we're only going 200 meters, right? We've got 100 meters from the PSC to the repeater and then 100 meter to the end devices. Uh, and I am adding 
uh, the resistance of a single repeater, again, assuming in this example that this repeater says it uses two watts or maximum consumption is two watts, uh, since there's only one repeater on this line and, and not two as the previous example. That gives us a, a maximum current of 1.1 amp. Multiply that by the voltage, we get 46.88 watts, uh, which again, needs to be distributed among all of the PDs. So if we have a multi-port repeater with you know, four PDs uh, connected to it, uh, together they will have 46.88 watts uh, between them. Uh, you can see why I used an 8023BT PSC because the, the multi-port repeaters really uh, will only work uh, – well, I mean, they, you'll only be able to get a usable amount of power uh, if you're starting with an 8023BT uh, PSC. I don't need the end devices to be 8023BT uh, for this to work, but uh, otherwise, if, if you were starting from 30 watts, uh, the, the available power being divided by multiple devices, it, it would just be uh, uh, not sufficient uh, for most devices. Okay, now let's talk about BVSL-based uh, the extenders. Uh, no one in the market calls them that. Uh, that's the technology, the underlying technology. Uh, these are typically just called Ethernet PoE extenders. Uh, I've seen Ethernet PoE over twisted pair, Ethernet PoE uh, over uh, – I, 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 yeah, I don't, I don't know whether what the terminology is, is used, but the way they work is they work in a pair. They're standard Ethernet in and out of the system. But between the pair, uh, they use VDSL uh, between them and, and pure uh, DC power over uh, whatever the medium is. Uh, since it's VDSL and not Ethernet, the medium between them uh, can be anything from a single pair up to, you know, category six uh, or even a, you know, a quax cable. Uh, a, and, and we're going to see how that a, changes our, our power calculations and distances. Uh, and then they typically, the local unit can be either AC powered or PUE powered. Uh, the remote unit is going to be powered in line and provide you know, standard PUE and, and Ethernet to the connected devices. Uh, in theory, the technology allows multiple devices. Uh, uh, at the end, but, but you know, from a power standpoint, we'll see that that becomes very limited. Okay, let's do an example. We're going to uh, assume that our local unit is AC powered. We've got 500 meters of category six, okay? What's my allowed voltage drop? Uh, assumption here is that I've got, the PSC is providing uh, 56 volts. Uh, the PD the minimum for the PD is 42.5, so that gives us a loud voltage drop of 13.5 uh, volts. Uh, we're going to calculate the resistance here. This is a category six. We're multiplying by a thousand because it's 500 meters round trip. But I'm dividing by four here because uh, these, if you provide them a cable uh, that has four pairs, like category six, it, they will use all four pairs. Right? And then I'm adding the resistance of the remote extender. In this case, again, uh, assuming that its uh, max consumption is, is 2 watts, uh, I do not need to add the local uh, extender because it's being AC powered. If it was being PoE powered, then, then I would have to add that into the calculation because it would be using up some – it would be on the same circuit. Doing the math. Uh, we come out with a maximum current of 0 0.61, which when we multiply by the voltage gives us 25.77 watts. We can see here, we can power, we can provide a full 802.3AT power, I mean 25.5 watts is all the PD can expect, right, at 500 meters over category 6 here, uh, which is significantly more than, than the spec defined 100 meters, right? So, uh, you know, this is, this is a solution uh, for going uh, much further. Uh, the reason we were able to do that uh, is, you know, one, it was using all four pairs, uh, and we also started out with uh, a, you know, a, a, de a device that, that is 
that, that is able to push into the, that circuit more. It, it, it doesn't have to do 802.3AT between the two devices. It's pure DC, right? Let's do another calculation. This time, uh, we are going 300 meters, but over a, a two-pair, you know, telephone wire, right? Uh, the loud voltage drop is going to be the same. Uh, this time, when we do the, the calculation to find out the maximum current, uh, so we see the resistance for uh, this telephone wire is, is much higher than a Category 6 is. It's basically double. Uh, we're only going 300 meters, so 600 meter, you know, multiplying by 600 for round trip. Because it's only two pair, we can, we can only divide by two. We can't divide by four here. Uh, so that gives us a maximum current of 0.295 amps, which when we multiply it by the voltage, uh, gives us only 12.5 watts. So it's usable if it's a low power device at the end, but we're seeing that, you know, this compared to the category six cable, even though we're only going half the distance or a little more than half the distance, we're getting half the power, right? So the, the medium uh, that is being uh, used is, uh, is, you know, critically important, right? Okay, let's get to our third type uh, of method of extending PoE, and that is composite fiber. Uh, sometimes also called hybrid fiber, powered fiber. Uh, all this is is basically uh, a, a fiber uh, that has inside the jacket also a two wire of uh, uh, various uh, gauge uh, uh, that can be used and we'll, we'll see the calculations for how you would pick that. Uh, but typically you would have a, a media converter switch, something uh, at the head end and a power supply at the head end uh, they, you know, the, the, the power supply gets connected to the two wires that connect to the power supply. The fiber uh, gets connected to the, the media converter the switch. They go together to a device uh, at the end where, you know, the power is used to power that device. Uh, the fiber goes into uh, the fiber port there, and then that device can provide PoE and, of course, connectivity to multiple PVs. Uh, important distinction from what we saw earlier, right? We are not running PoE over this uh, wire. Uh, we're running pure, you know, it's a pure DC circuit uh, to power this device. And, and that will, we'll see how that uh, influences our uh, calculations uh, in a second. Okay, so, uh, the way to think about it here is it's basically like a three-legged stool. You've got the power, the distance, and the, and the cable gauge. Uh, if you've got either any two of those, you could calculate the third. Uh, so we're going to start with the gauge calculation. What does that mean? Uh, that means that if I have a distance i got to go and I know how much power I need at, at the end, I can calculate what gauge uh, I need to get in, in my composite fiber, right? The way we do the calculation is, step one, you calculate the allowed voltage drop. Step two, we're calculating the required current. So that's going to be how much power is required at the end there, the, the, the power that the, the switch is going to consume or media converter, uh, plus whatever the PoE budget is. Uh, using that with the voltage, uh, that is available after the drop will give us what the required current is. That gives us basically a budget of, you know, how much, how much resistance we can, we can handle. Uh, since we know what the distance is, uh, that will give us how much resistance per meter or foot we can, we can deal. And then we look up in a uh, table such as this, uh, you know, how much, uh, which gauge cable I need in order to meet that resistance, uh, you know, limitation, right? Uh, I'm waiting, I think, for your screen to still update. There we go. So we see like the table like this. So let us do an example calculation. Okay. So in this example, we have a eight port switch with 802.3AT PDs. Uh, let's say we're 300 meters uh, from the head end, right? So we're gonna start with what's the allowed voltage drop? 
Okay, the voltage out of, uh, let's say, the, the, the power supply is 56 volts, uh, and the voltage that we, the minimum voltage that we can get at the PSC is 50 volts. Now, why are we talking about 50 volts here and not, you know, 42.5 like we were in the previous examples? Uh, if I go back to our table, we're going to see here that the minimum voltage at the PSC is 50 volts. Now, remember, we are powering the switch here. We're not powering, uh, you know, it, we're not going all the way. This isn't PoE on this circuit. This is just a DC. So we need to provide the switch 50 volts so that it can, you know, push that into the PoE circuit unless it has some kind of booster. Let's say the required uh, power uh, here is uh, 17 watts for the switch itself, plus, you know, just, just for this example, let's say we had a PoE budget, we needed 160 watts of power, whatever devices are connected to it, right? It's just for the example. Uh, we calculate that power divided by the, the voltage, we come out that we need 3.54 amps on this current on this circuit. Uh, that gives us a maximum allowed resistance of 1.69 ohms. We know distance, 300 meters multiplied by two. Uh, we divide that resistance by that and we come out with the maximum resistance per meter that we can, can handle is 0 0.0028. Right now, we're going to look up in our table. Sorry, we're going to look up in the table here, and uh, the this table has resistance per foot, a thousand feet and per kilometers. Uh, again, you can do this whole calculation and see if the distances you know are feet and so on. And the reason I used meters in this whole presentation is just because. Uh, nice round numbers, the, the, the spec was up to 100 meters and, and stuff like that, but, but you can definitely use feet. We go through here, again, this is per kilometers, our calculation was per meters, so we're going to be looking for uh, 2.8, uh, and we see that uh, the, the low, highest gauge, the, 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 the thinnest cable that it has a resistance below 2.8 is this one, 2.59, which is uh, 9 gauge, right? So that means that we need, in order to provide that much power at that distance, uh, we need, uh, a, you know, the minimum a gauge is that, that we can use is 9. Okay, let's do another example. Uh, this time we're going 400 meters. Uh, this time, I'm sorry, this is the power calculation. So we know the distance. We already have existing cable. It's 14 gauge. Uh, we got 82.3 AF PDs. Uh, we want to know how much power we can, we can provide at that distance. Now, in this case, when we calculate the allowed voltage drop, uh, we're going from 56 to 44. Because they're 82.3 AF, that means, if you remember, type 1 uh, PSC, the range is from 44 and uh, not from 50, so that gives us a little bit more space in our budget. Uh, and uh, when we do the calculation for the maximum current, uh, we are using here what is the resistance for a 14 gauge wire and multiplying by 800 because you know, 400 meters round trip. That gives us maximum current of 1.81 amp. When we multiply that by the voltage, that gives us 80 watts. So this is 80 watts that's going to be available for the switch plus devices connected to it, right? So we see, even though this is 400 meters and not, you know, which is less than the previous example, because it's a higher gauge, meaning thinner wire that we're uh, using, uh, we have less power available for the devices. Now let's do a distance uh, calculation. So in this case, uh, you know, we know how much power is needed. We have a gauge, but how far can we, can we run this cable and, and provide that? Uh, so again, since these are 823 AFPDs, uh, my voltage drop, allowed voltage drop is 12 volt because go 56 at the source down to 44. Again, I, I could have used 57 at the source uh, if, the power supply provides 57, give us a little bit more room. You know, this is uh, an example. Uh, 
the required current, uh, we need 120 watts, dividing it by our voltage gives us 2.72 amps. That means that the allowed resistance, uh, this budget that we have, if you will, is 4.412 ohms. Again, we know what the resistance per meter or per foot is of this cable. We know how much total budget resistance we can have. Now calculate how much distance we can go. Don't forget the multiplication by two here because we gotta go round trip. That tells us that the maximum distance we can go to provide 120 watts over the 14 gauge cable is 241 and a half meters, okay? <clears throat> okay, so let's do a, a comparison of these long distance PUE options uh, we discussed. When it comes to cost and complexity, PUE repeater is, you know, it's simple, it's low cost, uh, the VDSL PUE extenders, I mean, requires two devices. It's a bit more expensive. The VDSL protocol itself is not easy to troubleshoot if they don't sync between them. Uh, and the composite fiber also requires two devices and, and fiber, right? So, so you need to have the uh, you know, ability of working with fiber. Distance and power. The PUE repeater is limited. Uh, it's not uh, recommended for over 200 meters. Uh, VDSL PUE extenders can, can go much further, you know, theoretically up to 1,200 meters, though so, uh, limited power beyond 5, 600 meters. Uh, and the composite fiber can do, uh, you know, high power at longer distance. Number of devices, the PUE repeaters, theoretically up to four if they're low power. Uh, the VDSL PUE extenders, you know, up to two if the distance is short, but uh, in, in practice, I think um, both of these are usually one-to-one. -one. Uh, the composite fiber, though, you could, I mean, we saw an example there with uh, eight. Uh, in theory, if they're, you know, lower power devices, uh, you, you can get to double digit. Uh, you know, you, you, you could fully power a switch, let's put it that way. And if you needed more power, uh, then you would just need a uh, lower gauge, uh, you know, wires. Maintenance. The PUE repeaters are midline, uh, which, in my opinion, makes it a little bit more difficult from a maintenance standpoint. Uh, the VDSL PU extenders and composite fiber, the devices are at the edge, which which is better, easier. Uh, PU repeaters typically can, you know, can be gigabit. There's no problem with that. Uh, I see some vendors selling VDSL PU extenders that they say gigabit. They might do gigabit on the Ethernet side as a... a as, you know, as a supported rate, but VDSL itself does not get to those kinds of speeds. You know, maximum speeds are, you know, 400 uh, megabit or so, but as you get further out and these distances really would not expect uh, beyond 100 megabit of, of real uh, data throughput. Uh, composite fiber, I, I don't have in the spreadsheet here, but I mean, fiber can, can do easily do gigabit or even 10 gig or more. Uh, over any of these distances, so so there's there's really no data rate limit there. Uh, PoE repeaters are standard Ethernet and PoE, you know, all through. Uh, the composite fiber as well, but the VDSL PoE extenders, while it's standard Ethernet and PoE out of the system, it's it's VDSL and, and raw DC over the the multiple pairs in between. Uh, the PoE repeaters requires PoE at the source. Uh, the VDSL peak centers can be powered either through AC or PoE at the source, and the composite fiber needs a, a 4857, well, more like 57, but nominally it's called 48 volt power supply uh, at the source to, to, you know, provide DC power to the device. Uh, PoE repeaters and VDSL PoE extenders, I mean, it's copper cable, they're vulnerable to electric, electromagnetic surge if they're going to be outdoors, you know, outdoor Rated devices have some limited surge protection on the Ethernet ports. Uh, fiber's immune from that, but the two-pair electrical wire is, is not. It is vulnerable to, uh, you know, lightning strikes and so on. Uh, outdoor devices tend to have higher protection on the power input, uh, but that, that's still a risk. And from a security standpoint, uh, for our, you know, military friends, the they, they repeaters uh, and extenders I means copper. It's vulnerable to eavesdropping. Fiber's obviously not. 
the, the two wire in the composite fiber does not pass any data traffic, so, so there's no security risk there. It's purely power. Use cases, uh, I would use PoE repeaters in a PoE installation where there's you know, some runs that are slightly longer than the standard 328 feet, so let's say up to 600 feet, uh, or where you've got an existing run to a device and now I need to move that device, you know, 50 feet somewhere else. I can, you know, stick the extender there and, and run a new 50-foot uh, uh, cable to that other device. Uh, and or if I had an existing device there and now all of a sudden I need, I need to add a device instead of running another cable, I can use one of the multi-ports. Do use VDSL PU extenders, individual devices, that, that need to go significantly longer than that 328 feet, but, but up to like 600 meters. So you're talking about, I got a run here that needs to go 1,500 feet or something like that. It's a good use case. Uh, for places that the customer, for, for some reason or another, uh, either does not want or can't use uh, fiber or, you know, for cost reasons or, or otherwise. So I'm not, I'm not sure there's a huge difference in cost. Uh, and for using existing legacy cables. So... You know, we've got a old uh, analog camera system with quacks uh, or, or you know, we have telephone wires or running between buildings or something like that to these locations. We want to put IP PoE devices there. Uh, you can use the VDSL PoE extenders. Uh, you don't have to replace the, the existing infrastructure. Uh, composite fiber solution is for, we got long distances. I got multiple devices at each location. Uh, and or, you know, the location is high risk for, for lightning or requires fiber for security reasons, right? So, so this is going to be more of a solution for, I don't know, I got a, a, a parking garage where, where I need to put, you know, 10 cameras and, and security phones and stuff like that. Uh, I can run one fiber out to a switch, power that switch remotely and, and have that power and, and communicate all the devices versus, you know, DDSL PU extender or PO repeater or something like that where I would have to run 10, you know, separate uh, runs to those or, or at least multiples. Uh, and that is it uh, for this presentation. Uh, again, if you want to earn the Big C uh, continuing education credit, uh, then you need to do, you need to do this as a, as a live webinar where we document your participation. Uh, you can either see on our events page when we have one uh, next one scheduled or reach out to us and, and ask us and we'll let you know when we schedule one if there isn't one on the events page. Uh, thank you very much. I hope you uh, found this uh, informative uh, and uh, you can reach out to us at, you know, uh, tech support at sigmamax.com for any kind of design requests or questions uh, that come with the have with, uh, you know, uh, longer distance uh, POE uh, requirements. Thank you.